This is a HeadGum Podcast. Hello, hello, this is Fake the Nation, where we talk about news, we talk about politics, and where we lick our wounds. I'm your host, Nagin Farsad. Um, and when we have to shave my dog's butt, like, area, so that he can poop without it getting stuck in his fur, for the following week, he's always, like, irritated in that area and, like, rubs his butt against the ground. Um, and I feel like, as a nation, we are all rubbing our butts against the ground. Uh, so we're going to talk about that collective butt rubbing, if you will. <laughs> and we'll also um, talk about the uh, impact of the second Trump term on Hollywood. But we'll start talking about um, start by talking about Starbucks and whether it has lost its pizzazz. And oh my gosh, we have a really fantastic lineup for you today. We um, have with us, first up, writer, relationship coach, and mental health advocate. She has a new book out. It's called I Do, I Think, Conversations About Modern Marriage. You've heard her on this show before. You've loved her on this show before. It is the wonderful Allison Raskin. Hey, Allison. Hi, thanks for having me back. Um, we also have uh, another longtime favorite of the show. She's an on-air journalist. She's appear- she appears on Sirius XM, on LGBTQ Nation, um, on this podcast. Uh, you know her, you love her. It is the wonderful Alex Berg. Hey, Alex. Hey, Nagin. Happy to be here doing our proverbial dog but whatever it is <laughs> that we're doing. Um, a visual that I will not forget soon. I just feel very seen because I also have to do that with both of my dog's yeah, butts. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. And I always <laughs> think about this as a time and they have to deal with it. You know what I mean? It's just like a thing. It's not, they have to deal with it. So before we get into the butt rubbing, um, the which is also has so many other meanings mm-hmm. and other non-podcast <laughs> situations, um, I wanted to just remind listeners that they could go to patreon.com slash Nagin Farsad and now you can actually get a newsletter um, about the show for free. Um, in this newsletter, you'll find a bunch of the articles that help make the show and they will help make you an interesting person at cocktail parties. So you can become a free member of um, Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Nagin Farsad to get this monthly newsletter. And of course, for as little as $4 a month, you get bonus episodes of the show. It's super fun. We really let our hair down. Um, so uh, so don't forget to go to patreon.com slash Nagin Farsad. All right. Let's get into it with topic number one. Uh, Starbucks made its debut as a local coffee shop in Seattle in the 80s, which is really funny to think about because Seattle gave us grunge and Starbucks basically around the same time. It's so so (laughs) strange. But since then, it's ballooned into this like global brand. Now, in the last couple of years, however, sales have declined. And conversely, irritation at the Starbucks experience has increased. Um, Now, I'm a bit of a fucking snooteroo and I never go to Starbucks and I never did. I never went in the early days. I didn't go in the middle days and I do not go now. Um, To me, Starbucks is a thing you see at an airport and you walk by it. It's just like a, it's just like a a, a piece of, like it's like furniture. Um, Now I, uh, but I recognize that it is also, like the biggest fast food company, like one, but after McDonald's or I don't know, I, I should know this, this figure, but it's like among the top five globally. And it's huge. And that one thing that I remember is that Starbucks, when it came to my hometown was a big fucking deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, have you noticed a shift in Starbucks? Uh, and what do you think, Alex? I have noticed a shift in Starbucks. You know, I remember when Starbucks came to my neighborhood in Philly, like in the 90s, and it was very exciting because you could get a drink called a Frappuccino, and that seemed like special and unusual. And in recent years, now people are getting all of these kooky drink combinations, I guess, to each their own caramel, frap, oat milk, whatever it is that you're drinking. Um, But it's also just, there is like no personalized experience at Starbucks. People are getting these, you know, basically like coffee cocktails that take forever to make. You know, you're seeing them throw the food in that like convection oven for 10 minutes that it's just so like run of the mill coffee at this point. And this really made me think of the Starbucks that I loathe the most is the LaGuardia Airport Starbucks. I love this one the most because you will literally wait for just a drip coffee for like 
an hour, 45 minutes. I feel like I've been there and I've seen people being like, I got to go, like leaving my I'm stuff behind. my flight. Yeah, like I'm, I'm going to miss my flight if I wait, you know, another 15 minutes for this coffee that I ordered. So it's like, if you're not going to be the best, most gourmet coffee, at least be like a little bit fast. And so I feel like, you know, what purpose is Starbucks now serving? Unless I guess you're dedicated to whatever your sugary combination drink is. Yeah, what do you think, Allison? I also just think there's been a lot of like uh, brand issues with, you know, the union busting and like the affiliation with, I, I, I have to admit, I don't totally understand, but with, with supporting, not being on the right side of the genocide in Palestine with their business endeavors and all of that. And, and so I just feel like it's had a real reputation shift where people that are really thoughtful about what uh, businesses they like to partake in um, that like the idea that like, Starbucks is a good brand is no longer. I feel like when it started, it was like, oh, they pay their workers fairly. It's like this whole new version yeah, of the business. it had such a great business. reputation yeah, in those days. Mm -hmm. It really did. And that's been totally shattered. And so then you combine that with then like the actual user experience being total and utter chaos. I could see why with now there being so many more options too, it's, it's lost its control of the market. Yeah, it's interesting because like, and in this, you know, we there's there's been some reporting about this because of the major declines, and they brought in a a, a CEO who wants. By the way, I think he's only getting paid like a hundred million dollars. Poor guy. Um, but, <laughs> but um, by the I just I'm a I I know this is never going to happen, but caps on CEO pay Truly. anyone anyone <laughs> Truly. okay. Just like I just, I just think he would still be happy if he only got twenty million. I'm just gonna say that controversially that he would still be really like a really, really, really happy guy. But he would be the poorest of his friends. But he would know, be the poorest of his hard. friends. Aww. That's true. <laughs> so it's so hard. It's so hard. Um, but so he's gonna get paid a bunch of money to try and do. I think and and like what they did at Chipotle or whatever. He brought in some other people from Chipotle. And the interesting thing, like about it, that I think made such a huge impact on the world was coffee culture mm -hmm. but by the way i mean coffee culture preceded starbucks starbucks was just the one that ended up be franchising right but like coffee culture became a global phenomenon i think in large part because starbucks then spread it you know mm -hmm. like we tried to do with democracy and <laughs> with, and you know and it was interesting because like the idea was like you fucking go you get you get a coffee that's like a little expensive but not too much but it feels a little bit like a treat that you deserve and you sit there for like a full hour if not longer and you kvetch with your friends or you read a book and and i think you know and it's funny because like like i said like, i remember coming to to my hometown in Palm Springs and everyone getting really excited. I stuck with Peabody's shout out Peabody's. I think it's no longer there, but anyways, across the street, um, because it was a coffee culture that preexisted, um, that Starbucks, but you know, it was a place that you kind of go, it was a little bit like for cruising, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, who am I going to run into at Starbucks? And, um, and it was a kind of exciting and that feeling that you go there as, as that there's a communal element of it, or that there's something fun about the, about the barista saying your name or whatever, all of that seems to have really gone. Because they also have taken chairs out of the Starbuckses. They don't like necessarily want you to hang out, which seemed to be its like main thing in the early days. To me, it was always that it had so many options that it had all of these like weird, interesting drinks that like often weren't even coffee based, uh, you know, for the non the non coffee lovers in our lives, like my father. Um, also, love of love your use of the word cruising. Not sure if, if what you meant by that, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> like I don't know what, what Starbucks you went like, to. Going yeah, on in Palm Springs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just like, I don't know. So, I mean, I mean, like checking people out, like just, ooh, who am I going to run into? Just like, I, I don't know. What is that? Wrong use of that term. Um. <laughs> what, is, what is that called? Well, I, because when I was little and they used to take over downtown Palm Springs during spring break, they would cruise downtown and they would say everyone's cruising downtown or whatever and so like that anyways but I, and now Seems like and now the term has shifted and anyways i'm still a child it was a place I'm to saying. see yeah. and be seen i guess around yeah, town, yeah, you yeah, know yes. yeah, yeah yeah socialize yeah, yeah I, for some reason starbucks never felt like a place you went to hang out for me it was more like it was just like any drink you could want they had and they would get it quickly um 
but yeah, I, I just think that it that there's just so much there's an oversaturation, mm-hmm. which I feel like we're seeing in so many industries across oh, yeah. the board. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you have had just such, you know, exponential growth for so long, eventually, you're gonna hit a ceiling. And so then, you know, I'm sure compared to so many other companies, it's still doing well. But like, how do you keep going when you're that big? Also, the other weird thing that they've done is like, which I think is a problem. uh, Another problem across the board is like, a lot of companies made pandemic era changes, Mm -hmm. like mobile orders and whatever, which don't feel like quite right anymore you know um and i i just want to invite all of these places to like to pull those back and just remember that we're like still human beings you know what i mean like why not sure what is the point of a mobile i'm i'm a lo- i feel like i'm a 85 year old woman on this issue but like i don't get the point of a mobile order in the starbucks context you order really? a coffee and then you get there and it's like a little cold by the time you're picking it up. You don't know you don't how have, long it's been sitting there. You don't have there. to wait. You well, allegedly, you don't have to allegedly wait, but then, you don't have to wait. Allegedly. But then you're actually allegedly, you're waiting you 45 wait. minutes because everybody's, right? I well, feel like. you don't know. Yeah, because it's all yeah. messed up, the mobile order. I mean, I've never, I've never done it because my, fe- my feeling about a coffee is that it should, I should get a third degree burn by ju- putting you. it in my, like, uh, it should be really fucking yeah, hot. Yeah. And if it's not really fucking hot, a failure, yeah. there's been a failure. And so to me, a mobile order always felt like a possibility for, fa- like a, a, a certainty of failure, because it's not going to be a scalding hot thing. If I've put, if I put in the order at some amount of time before, you just don't know. But I feel you like know what I mean? that speaks to like this idea that every element of their business is watered down in addition to having, um, you know, the union issues and, um, you know, like being maybe complicit in the genocide in Palestine. I, you know, I don't know as much about it, but um, on top of just the general watered down, it's like the coffee is watered down. Now they're just doing such a high volume of orders that like there are so many people going in off of these online yeah. orders. They don't even have seats. It's like kind of just a place that you move through. And now it's like, if I just wanted to get in like a long line with stanchions and just be in and out, I would go to Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts. So, you know. That's ex- and that, by the way, shout out O'Hare Airport. That's what I do. Because <laughs> I, because that you, because I, if I want to not have a vibe, there's plenty of places to go to not have a vibe. Exactly. You know I mean? Don't make me you go don't to pee. Play- Right. You don't need to pay a premium to not have, then also not have a vibe. You know what I mean? There should at least be a comfortable little couch i don't know it, 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 i find it fascinating because it's like the only you know mcdonald's and wendy's and all these things were just sort of like are like just a part of the american firmament i feel like they've just been here breathing since the dinosaurs i don't know from whence they came but like um starbucks is a thing i feel like we saw it emerge mm-hmm. and it was so it's been interesting to see a global brand like take over like this um by the way don't bring up china to the starbucks ceo Cause that'll, he'll shed a million dollars from his hundred million just by thinking about it. Apparently the China scene's really bad for them. They had like um, something like 14% losses or something in China. So it's a sore subject. The Chinese also, uh, they don't want to pay the, the prices. So that's the other thing we didn't even mention, which is the prices um, have, have gone up and people are like, I can't, you know? And uh, well, we're going to talk about prices maybe in the next segment. Um, but uh, that's something that people I think are rightfully saying cool it on the prices guys <laughs> i didn't you know, know if we were transitioning it's just something we are transitioning. I, just, I didn't know if you had like another i you you know what you guys both delightfully smiled and i and that my friends is the close of the section i wish everyone could see that delightful smile all right folks let's take a quick break let me know what do you think about starbucks i'm, I'm just fascinated by having seen this thing and and, and what will its future be it's obviously not going to go anywhere but it's going right. to be different probably um and so maybe this you know what in a year from now the three of us will convene and we'll see yes. if that guy earned his 100 million dollars we'll just let's see we'll do a little <laughs> uh, a little analysis all right let's take a quick break and when we come back there'll be more and we are back and we're ready for topic number two okay so I don't know what phase of grief we're all in from this election. Last week's episode felt like it was recorded in like a fugue state. Um, So now that we're like a little less raw, I wanted to talk about what happened, but also um, uh, talk about a way forward uh, and, and, and talk about what happened in terms of like constructively, you know, for like understanding 
how we could not do that again, yeah. for example. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to start first with the idea of how Trump pulled this off. Um, he, you know, people, people say a lot. I mean, I don't know if, if he's probably, there's been more think pieces about that guy than, than Jesus. I think if you had to compare, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I have to do the numbers, but so everything has been said about this guy and it's, and it's, uh, his communication skills are baffling to me because they don't work on me. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, it's like Starbucks. I do, I never drank there. And so I don't get it exactly, but obviously I'm in, I, there's so many people that it, for whom that is, they love that. And so can you, so explain to me how he pulled this off. I personally don't think there's like one singular reason about how he pulled it off. And I think in these moments, it can be really tempting to try to distill it down to one thing. But I think there are many layers. Um, And among them, I think Biden had a really low approval rating. Harris, obviously, inextricably linked to the Biden administration as the vice president. Very difficult for her to totally separate herself. Um, And also, I think she took the high road in many instances when she was actually asked, how are you going to be different from Biden? And she said she wasn't going to change things that they were doing. I think there's a lot of people who just wanted to change the status quo. And for them, they're not following along uh, with Trump's rhetoric as closely and his policy plans and Project 2025 as closely. So for them, he simply represents a change in the status quo. A lot of people have said he just doesn't talk like a politician. And for them, that was enough. I think we can't uh, overstate how much racism and sexism play a role in this and all elections. Um, I think in terms of people's internal biases that would um, drive them to vote for Trump over um, Kamala Harris. Um, and the way that that also just pervades the right wing media narratives about her. Um, and then I also think that Harris only had a hundred and some days to run an entire campaign. And I think in the beginning, we saw such an amazing amount of enthusiasm for her. But I think any Democratic candidate who only had a hundred freaking days, 107 days to introduce themselves and come up with a clear message when Trump has been campaigning since before 2016, people really understand what his messaging is. And I think like on that messaging point, I think it was hard for Harris to clearly formulate what she was about. She proposed a lot of different policies, but I think for Trump's followers, It really just comes down to make America great again, which is a stand in for go back to 1950s America. So they understand exactly what they're voting for. And it's a very compelling message for them. Um, And then finally, um, I think the disinformation going out over all of these very male centric podcasts, we've just moved to the right, or I should say, The people who voted for Trump um, at large have moved to the right, uh, I think, overall. Um, And as a country, we're moving more to the right. Mm -hmm. And I think Americans just don't have a great sense of media literacy. Yeah, you're right. Where their media consumption has become more focused, more concentrated. Yeah, exactly. So I think there are like so many different layers. And, you know, we can obviously do a deep dive on any one of these things. But I think they all contributed to why we are now in this moment. Um. Thank you, Alex. Allison, your turn to let it out. Get it off your <laughs> chest. <laughs> no, I definitely spent the, the first few days after just like scrambling to understand why, because the initial reaction is like, oh, people are, are this evil, this ill-intentioned, this sexist, this racist. And I do believe that that is a big contingent of his base, like Alex was alluding to, like it is fueled by the sexism, racism, and Zion. Uh, oh my God, no, sorry. sexism, racism, and... um xenophobia and then i also really had to just like take a historical perspective uh in the sense that it is so common for when uh, a nation feels that the economy is not doing well to vote out the current party like that is just like a historical trend that we see all of the time and this gets to the misinformation part right where the, okay yes i uh, that the economy, the price, the cost of living is far too high. And I think that the Democrats really messed up their messaging around the economy because they were looking at these other indicators because like, yes, again, abortion say, is that what you mean? No, that like the stock market is doing. Well. Oh, like, I see. The Sorry, economy yeah. is actually a very strong economy it is, in yeah. like economic terms, but not in the terms of what a regular person is experiencing in their life. So to say, hey, we've actually stopped the rate of inflation and Biden did some really great policies to bring inflation down. They say, but then why do my eggs still cost more than they did two years ago? So there was just this disconnect between 
like how a more um, like informed economic mind would look at the economy versus just like the reality of daily living. And like, it doesn't matter if, it can't, if inflation has slowed, if the prices are still high and my salary hasn't caught up to that. Right. So I think there was just a real mess up in um, offering a clear other option that wasn't just Trump is bad. And so I feel like the Democrats really needed to have a better story and have a better narrative where like there was acknowledgement that like, yes, this system isn't working and we are going to offer you a different solution than Trump is rather than just we're not Trump. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And actually everything's fine. And, you know, your 401k is up and all these people are like, I don't have a 401k, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I also think yeah. like even within the campaign and around that messaging, like, I feel like we never heard from Democrats that like we are here for working people. And like, right. I think that also in the campaign, something that was interesting to think about. And I, I feel like, listen, we could do all of this quarterbacking, look at every single thing, critique everything and never fully understand. But I think that in the beginning, there was this moment where like, Waltz was like the man of the people calling Republicans weird. It felt like, um, you know, he could have been a uh, like really we could have harnessed his power to talk to working people. Um, and it feels like I know from the campaign, a lot of the Obama folks came in, there was this big pivot to using a lot of celebrities where I feel like a lot of the messaging got kind of Love. to use the word watered down again, it got, it got watered down and he wasn't really allowed. He went from being like super authentic guy to just then kind of being molded into this more like normalized democratic type of candidate and I felt like what was special about choosing him is that he was more progressive, had done all of this cool stuff with like school lunches and things that really speak to like these economic needs right. that people have. Yeah. And I think that, and, and, and that's a great point about Walls because, uh, you know, we, you talk about like the future of the party. You think about a guy like Walls, and again, I don't know what his particular future could be after this, yeah. but, um, you know, he might, he might sort of like have to stick to Minnesota, but um a guy like that who says, um, call me crazy, I like feeding children, right? Like, that's how he explained his school policy on lunches. That's the kind of language, that's why we liked him, because he says stuff like that that's very clear. It's, it's like, also, it's like, um, you can't argue with it, right? It's just clear, it's humane, everyone needs lunch, The kid, all the kids need lunch, you know what I mean? It's just like... It, those kinds of statements really work and they communicate to everyone regardless of their income level, regardless of their education level, everyone gets that. Um, and it's also um, br broad universal policies that aren't um, confusing, uh, which is I think why Bernie Sanders was so, yeah. was so popular because he was just like universal healthcare, like just give it to everybody. Billionaires will have it. And I mean, you know, it's just like people don't want to figure out what they're eligible for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like being able to have a, a clearly communicated policy that you can distill into like a, into simple language. And I think simple language is just like the, I mean, I think it's oddly, you know, if I, I mean, I am loath to say that he has a gift. I mean, I think he just has incredible amounts of luck and like a huge inheritance. Mm -hmm. Um, but but if he if he's if he has a gift, it's that he's able to say things. Um, and maybe just because he was never like a tremendously great speaker, like so it's like he had to use the words that he had and in and that made it so that he you spoke really simply and clearly. And he says it over and over and over again. And so and he's so not afraid of being dull. Uh, that's the other weird thing. Is and it, the it man, goes into your head. You believe the it. man is exceedingly dull because uh, as you as we saw, people would leave his rallies, but it doesn't matter because it's like he got the message across, repeating the same boring thing over and over and over and over and over again. Because like that's kind of you know yeah, I mean that's what you need to do to get to get it across. And I think there's also a huge contingent of people that voted for Trump that don't believe the words that come out of his mouth. And this is the really baffling contingent for me, right? The people that are like, he's not actually going to use the Justice Department to go after his enemies. He's just talking. And I want to be like, Everyone hmm. said that to me. Yeah. And all of my, <laughs> all, in all of my conversations in, in swing states, I mean, to a person, people would say, I might vote for him because of the economy, because of inflation, because of the price of eggs. And then they would say... Um, and then they would say, I mean, I think he's a horrible guy and I don't want to be his friend, but I don't have to hang out with him if he just for him to fix the economy, you know, 
And, and, and that's the, the, the you know, the, there is a recognition. People are not crazy. Like they see that he's horrible. Right? And I think there's a cognitive dissonance of them saying, but that, that he won't follow through on the really And then there's stuff. that other aspect of, yeah, that they, that they that, won't, that, that, that he won't follow talk. through. Yeah. So I'm not actually supporting these beliefs that he's said so many times that he yeah. tends to do because that's just talk. And they think it's theatrics. Yeah. We'll see how that plays out. And already he's going after the Department of Education. Yeah. And I guess my, my next question is about sort of like, how do you bring in the dudes? You know what I mean? I would, I, you know, we, we, I mean, I don't know if I, if I talked about this before, but like, you know, like the thing with masculinity is that there isn't like a clear something around it. Like, you know, when you're, um, you know, we grew up in like girl power era. Right. And, um, and everyone was like, you could do whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. And, but the same is not, it's not that no, people didn't say that to men. It's just, they didn't say to men, you could do whatever you want, including being a teacher or a nurse. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There wasn't, mm-hmm. there isn't, it's like, we, sh- we needed a, a campaign, <laughs> the, the, the girl power campaign for men to like, sort of like, be okay with other forms of, of um, being a man, which are equally as strong. Yeah. Like being a nurse is very fucking strong. You know what I mean? Um, but we just didn't. So, so, so there's, so that messaging has, so there's no messaging for men, I guess is my point. No, I feel like we need men to understand patriarchy is bad for them too, you know, and it's just as harmful to them as everyone else. And I think that that's the other piece of this is that, you know, a lot of time fascist leaders really mirror patriarchal family structures. And I think that that is very seductive to people and to men and young men who feel like they've been slighted because, um, you know, women and non-binary folks have have had more direct messaging about how we should be elevated and how we are strong and how we should have, um, you know, more gender equity. And I feel like, and listen, I have no idea how you message this to men um, at all. Um, but I think that like, again, to go back to Waltz, like having these different um, reflections of masculinity um, that are also celebrated is one good place to start rather than this like yeah. strongman image that is very seductive to, to a lot of guys. So, so there was in the last, in the, during the first administration and just in general in the last 10 years, I feel like there's been a lot of like, don't go on certain shows because you're giving like Joe Rogan or whatever, like right wing things, because you're kind of giving them um, credibility by by going on those shows. Um, Allison, do you think that's a mistake? I do. Yeah. And I also think that there's been a mistake in that we haven't found like someone to to take the place of a Joe Rogan on our side, someone that does have that direct connection to men that is offering that other option. Um, I, I was interviewing some uh, a psychologist for my one of my other books years ago who was saying at the time and his whole expertise was in uh, men's mental health, how like there is no good role model here, right? Like there is right ring role models, but we don't have a more progressive or a liberal like man that has like, a a following where he can like model how you can live the way we've been talking about, you know, you have like Joe Rogan and the liver King. Right. (laughs) So I think that like, we really have to understand the media landscape and we have to not only just like let our, our candidates, you know, talk to Joe Rogan and talk to Theo Vaughn, all of those things, but we also have to put money into more progressive influencers yeah, <laughs> because yeah. it is so much easier to make money as a conservative influencer because you are in the you are in the best interest of billionaires mm-hmm. and you're in the best interest of these people and these companies that will give you yeah backing and we don't have that on the left right we, right it's, it's just people that are like being supported purely by their fans they're not getting the same level of financial support yeah and this is oh, a does, new does, does fake the nation come to mind sorry but, go ahead. i mean <laughs> I mean, truly, and especially as we're going to see that, like, um, places like the Washington Post are not going to feel comfortable doing real news in a way anymore with their with their Bezos at the helm, telling them not to endorse a candidate, right? Like, it's going to really fall on these independent news sources and these independent creators and influencers. And like, to me, 
that's where Bill Gates should be putting his money. He should, like, Bill Gates needs to go find a guy that is really compelling, great on screen, great with his audience, who has the right the right thoughts, the right beliefs, and then, like, give that guy the money to make a media empire. Because I feel like that is the way that, like, this world works now, whether or not we we like it. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like Democratic candidates need to be meeting people where they are and where they're consuming their news. And they should be going on Joe Rogan and Theo Vaughn and, you know, Bernie Sanders has done that um, and engaging in conversations with them and, you know, standing 10 toes down uh, in the policies that they believe in and, you know, like not trying to become more right leaning on these podcasts. Like, I think that's one of the other things is that, you know, there is a sense sometimes that like Democrats are going to like, you know, try to shape themselves into these more moderate candidates. And I think that people can sense when something doesn't feel real and true, or if they're just kind of changing uh, to fit whatever wherever the political tide is going. Um, so I definitely think they need to be in these spaces, um, meeting people where they are and unafraid to go into these spaces. And I think like one of the tricky things about developing a, you know, a progressive Joe Rogan type is it's also like a lot of these podcasts didn't start out as um, political or news shows like they no, start out yeah. as like Theo Von, it like was a more organic yeah, than that exactly. yeah, and they sort yeah. of start to move in to these spaces or you know uh, right wing campaigns were very deft in identifying that these were spaces that they could pitch their candidates to go on and talk to people and you know start pervading the the landscape with their ideas um, and so I think also one of the tricky things is because progressives and, and people on the left like truth and don't, maybe don't want to be as hyperbolic about different ideas and, and don't want to wade into being like a shock jock. I think a lot of times like these shows do so well because some of the content they have can be kind it's of controversial, yeah, it's controversial yeah. or oversimplified. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think that's also just like one of the challenges of developing someone in this space. But I think it's like all the more reason for all of us to support shows like this and support our favorite podcasters. And I think we almost need like a Trojan horse. I wonder if Call Her Daddy will kind of become this a little say, bit more yeah, 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 yeah. where you know she this is call her daddy is was not intended to be a political podcast and now she's right. having like these real conversations because she cares about um women's issues and reproductive health care so i wonder if like that is if there's something there you know yeah, yeah. and also it doesn't have to be one person you know right. what I mean? I think I think you're right, um, Al uh, Allison. It's a, it's kind of about building a a universe of of these people. Like I, you know, the just the fa the fact that like the right has some uh, so, so this all of this power concentrated in Joe Rogan, I think, is a little crazy. Um, it you know, it, there's and I'm not saying he's the only one. There's like others, but like it's a lot concentrated in him. You know, mm -hmm. um, and there's I think uh, you know something to be said for like you know having a little bit of a more of a more disperse effect on, yeah. with like more, more shows than just that um and i yeah and i agree i mean i think the other pro you know it's interesting because like when my book came out years ago i asked my publicist to send me put me on right-wing shows because i wanted to have those conversations and part of that led to just like some casual death threats and stuff like that. It was not pleasant all the time, but sometimes it was really pleasant. It was like super nice. So I do think you're also, you know, I personally like, I don't, I'm, I love going on these things. You know, I love, I love, to, like, I love, you know, um, after like my, you know, after 2016, like my, I said to my agents, like, please send me to red States. That's where, I, that's only where I want to perform. Mm. I only want to perform in red States. And so um, we also I feel like there needs to there's like a there's like especially in stand up comedy, you know, and you guys know a ton of stand up comics. We go into like the same towns and and it's like one net a circuit. Um, but I think we can broaden that. You know what I mean? We can go into different places. This requires money. You know, I just did this show. The Muslims are coming in Reading, Pennsylvania. I made the tickets free, but I had to do that with patronage. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't mm -hmm. just fucking hire comedians to go with me right. on the road for free. You know what I mean? I, but it doesn't work. But these cities will not generate income. Mm -hmm. they, we don't we won't sell enough tickets in those places. To, there should be more of a cultural exchange. We're living too much like separate entities, you know what I mean? And I think a cultural exchange um, has uh, could have a lot to do with that. Now, there's so much more to say. We didn't even scratch the surface. Um, folks, and I do want to um, ask you guys, like, 
you know, like next week, we're going to talk about, you know, some of the crazy people that he's, um, um, t- you know, thinking of nominating for his cabinet positions and all that stuff. And we'll do, we'll, t- we'll do more of the like regular um, kind of talk on the show about politics. Um, but please let me know if there's, if there's a certain way or a certain thing that you would like to see more or less of. I'm all ears because um, I want to do this era right <laughs> I don't want to be fucking depressed. You know what I mean? I I want to um I want to continue to be hopeful and optimistic. I believe pendulums swing one way and then they swing back the other. Um so so I you know, we, I'm not saying this is going to fucking be pleasant, but like I do believe we're going to get through it and I do think we can have some laughs along the way. So, um anyway, so listeners, hit me up whatever with whatever. But I mentioned um cultural exchange which brings up our next topic topic number three um i am curious to know you know what kind of film and television we might see now that trump is coming back hollywood feels like it's already in a state of upheaval um because if you're like me and you've always got like a script up your sleeve no one is buying and the mantra right now in hollywood is survive till 25 it has just been a bleak so that's been fun um, now, with all, Hollywood already in a shit state, um, what do you think might happen with its cultural production during the next four years? Any thoughts? <laughs> as much as I want to be optimistic, you know, um, I, I, I live in, in LA. I'm, I'm a screenwriter as well as all the other things I do. My husband's a screenwriter. It's, it's been brutal and terrible. Um, <laughs> yes. Look, I, I think that the whole system isn't working. I think that what we're going to find in a few years is that we just return to the cable model. <laughs> like we had this grand experiment of all of these streamers and it's not sustainable. I, I think, again, like it's back to this idea of like exponential growth is not like forever and then you start if that's your whole model you start to panic um and so i i really think that we're going to see like a consolidation we're going to see like things being offered as like you can get hulu and netflix and, and disney plus for this right. one price and it's like oh this is cable cable uh, yeah and is, <laughs> um and you're and, still gonna have ads or else you're gonna pay a shit exactly. ton more and people are exactly. gonna be like oh i'll fall suffer through ads yeah Yeah. And so I think that there's still a lot of remnants of the strike. Um, I think that it happened at a time when the interest rates also went up. So suddenly it's way more expensive to To make a show because Mm -hmm. now you, oh, I have to pay people fairly and money is no longer free. And so there's sort of this sense of, well, you did this to yourself. Like you asked for this and now we can't afford you. Um, and at a certain point, it's going to have to break. There has to be new content, but I'm not like overwhelmingly hopeful that like 2025 suddenly it's going to be like, and your script is greenlit. And, and you get script a script, is yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Alex, you know, uh, we were reading, a, uh, I read a piece in MSN that said, quote, Hollywood has been reluctant to make art that could alienate the huge swaths of the country that voted for the once and future president. The film and TV industry, which was battered by COVID, disrupted by strike and fears annihilation by AI is unlikely to want to take such a financial risk now. So do you think, um, what do you think about that statement, Alex, that like there's not going to be very much risk taking, uh, I guess, politically um, because of fear yeah. of, of of the of people who voted for him? I agree with it. I mean, I think that since Trump won the popular vote, there will be a total capitulation to the entire country's shift rightward. And also because he has promised retribution against his political enemies and against media outlets, um, I think we'll see what we already saw happen with the Washington Post, where um, there won't be the kind of projects won't be stuff that really challenge is social justice centric is also, you know, or really like challenges fascism uh, and the Trump administration um, through storytelling. Um And I also think that like there are some parallels between what we've seen in terms of the um, backing away from um, DEI efforts that we're also going to see pervade in art. Um, So, for example, um, we know that Mm -hmm. a lot of corporations are already walking back their DEI efforts, which also means they're like, and I've seen this in the media work that I do, there were a bunch of corporations that were funding like LGBTQ content. You know, they got this mandate in 2020 um, to start putting money into these programs. And like that money is gone. They are walking it back. Um, And I expect to see that that will also impact media and other kind of like art grants as well. Um, So, and, and I was just thinking about like some of the shows 
that were made during the last Trump administration that feel like like impossible or really challenging to make today. I was thinking about the television show Pose and what it would take to create um, art that really like centers some of the most marginalized folks in our culture and society. And it feels like like will studios want to put their money into those projects, knowing that there has just been such a they, they should do it, but knowing there has been such a, a backlash um, against uh, everything that that show symbolizes. So, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I wonder. I mean, look, I don't know what the numbers were for Pose, um, but if the numbers were good, then then they I think they will. I think it all, literally will just come down hmm. to like numbers. I just think. I, that's kind of where I see it all coming down. I think if they're like a super queer show, um, but it's hugely popular, like I don't think RuPaul's Drag Race is going anywhere. You know what I mean? It's an incredibly popular show. It makes a ton of money. So there's no no reason to take that off the air. And I think that re Republicans who have ownership stake in that show probably, I'm assuming <laughs> Listen, there are. We know are. there's some Republicans oh. watching RuPaul's Drag Race, okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Exactly. So I don't think I don't think that the, I, I think it's just going to come down to numbers and then any and then if it happens that the show has a good message or has a diverse cast, that's just a bonus that yeah. we get like as, as a society. But it's not like not the driving. For, it's not it won't be a driving force. I don't think uh, I think you're right that it will. Yeah, like it's it, it will probably not see um it, you know, more mission driven content in that way. Um, it's funny because I was reading, I think this was in Vanity Fair. They made a prediction. Oh, I'm, I can't remember. Sorry. I think I'm misattributing it. Maybe it was still an MSN. They wrote in a few years time, I expect to see darker, bleaker American fair more in with, um, more in line with just a viably nervous, cynical work of the post nine eleven years than anything mm -hmm. that came out of twenty sixteen to twenty twenty. Um, I thought that was interesting that it would just be, you know, I mean, if 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 we're if we're capitulating to the Joe Rogan audience, or if we're like, oh men, you know, then <laughs> then we're like then we're like doing war stuff like, or something. You know, you were doing Yellowstone, yeah, Yellowstone meets war. Or like, or like Sons of Anarchy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. it'll be Mad like motorcycles yeah. and horses and, and wars. And then that's, you know. Um, but I but at the same time, if you look back at, 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 like, for example, the works of Shonda Rhimes, that woman is like ladies and people of color <laughs> and money. And it's just like... <laughs> prints money so then you're like well i don't know because that prints yeah. money too and so i just i i i feel like the the funny thing is me and my husband have been watching the reboot of matlock um oh, how god, is it god bless kathy bates she's just um you know uh she's she's just, she's just a legend of film and television um and the thing is it's like it's fine um it's it's comforting. You know? <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of comfort shows, and I think that the I think that I, and maybe this is just my own bias and hope, considering I'm in this space. But I think that there'll be a lot of rom coms mm. and a lot of like romance, and I think a lot of like escapism um, for people that because like the world is so bleak that they like you know like you see Hallmark is still doing really well, you know, um, and so. I, while there might also be like this big shift into like man content, I think that also like they're going to feed um, a more female driven audience with like, imagine a world where you were treated like an equal, <laughs> which isn't like as ex explicit <laughs> as like, you know, right. something like pose or something that like it's right yeah, in your yeah, face, yeah. but just like showing a world where like you don't have to fear for your life every day and men do treat you well and like, you know, um, I, I wonder if that genre will also, because it's been doing better in the last flourish, few years, huh? but it might even flourish even more. Yeah, I th you know, can I also just say that, like, I was thinking back to the forces that gave us Obama, and we were watching a lot more of the same television shows, huh. you know, huh. in the early 2000s. Interesting. And so right. is it, is it, do we all just sort of need a bunch of matlocks and, and rom-coms? with gentle storylines and just mini tiny social uh critiques um <laughs> that then we can maybe all get on the same page and then vote for a normal you know what i mean <laughs> like i don't know i'm just there's a, there, there's a possibilities here that like if 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 the entertainment um spectrum narrows into a comfortable field 
that maybe that happens and then we get like a resurgence of an Obama type. Yeah, I, I, you know. I also wonder, like, I remember, was it the early 2000s that we got the Lord of the Rings movies and also we got the Harry Potter movies? Like, when did those come out? Because those are like, you know, yeah, the battle of good versus evil is like very, very mm. clear in those. And I wonder oh if my there God, will that's be- that's so funny. Yeah, I wonder if there'll also be like an appetite for stuff like that. Also, Lost came out in 2004. So the battle versus oh, good versus smoke monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I uh, yeah, there's something here, guys. Yeah. I feel like we just wrote a think piece about this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me know. What do you think uh, will happen to the future of content um, in a second Trump term? The, the possibilities are endless or only money oriented. Unclear. And folks, that is the end of the show. What a wonderful conversation. Um, I'm so glad you guys uh, decided to do the show and uh, bless us with all of your wonderful insights. And what I would like now is for you to tell the people of Faith the Nation where they can follow you and all your wonderful work. Um, Allison, where do they do that? Yes. Um, so I'm on the internet at Allison Raskin. I also have a podcast called Just Between Us that uh, has a new episode every week. And then you can also find me on um, Substack Emotional Support Lady, which is also an Instagram, all mental health focus. And then you can buy my new book, I Do, I Think, Conversations About Modern Marriage, anywhere books are sold. Um, folks, definitely uh, join, uh, uh, follow um, Allison. And obviously, if you do subscribe to Just Between Us, you should know that her co-host is the wonderful Gabe Dunn, who is also a regular on this uh, show. Um, this show is just degrees of Allison Raskin. That's all we do. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so follow all of her stuff. Um, Alex Berg, where do they where do they find you? You can find all of my work at itsalexberg.com and love to hear from folks on social. Just look for me as it's Alex Berg, and that's it. Guys, Alex, by the way, you know, me and Andrew, our producer, we're just talking about um, your posting on the elections and, and your really great insight. I, definitely please follow oh, thank her you. Uh, because there's some really great things you could glean from Alex on a regular basis. Uh, and then not to mention all the, all the places where you can hear her, like LGBTQ Nation and on Sirius. All right, and folks, you know where to find me and all the things that I do. Um, do I have something? I, I have a piece out. Did I mention this? I don't remember. I have a piece out in the Progress, my, my latest um, column in the Progressive. So check that out. I have It's the one about me going uh, around to America. And I think it's a hopeful piece. So I think you should check it out because you might feel better, theoretically. Um, otherwise, I want to thank everyone who makes the show a possibility. That's our wonderful producer, Andrew McGuire. Thanks to Gabby Alter for our theme music. Thanks to everyone at HeadGum. If you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, you can email us at fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to go to patreon.com slash making for to support the show. Otherwise, we'll be back in your earballs next week. That was a headgum podcast. <laughs>